very, very, very honored and humbled to be have to have been invited to come and speak to um, to, to the Concord Church. And thank you, Danny, for reaching out and for that invitation. It's a it's a real privilege for me to be here. Um, before I start with my sermon, if we could just bow our heads for a short word of prayer. Loving Father, we thank you so much for the freedom that we have to come and worship you. Be with us now. May the Holy Spirit be here and may we feel his presence and may the words that come out of my mouth be your words. In Jesus' name, amen. So my sermon today is entitled, What is Good? And it's based on the verse found in Ma Micah 6, verse 8. And if you, many of you know this verse, it's a very famous verse in the Bible. But you're welcome to find the verse in the Bible and, and read with me. And Micah, I have to confess, is very hard to find in the Bible. It's one of those little minor prophets that's stuck between just after Jonah and, uh, and before Nahum. But it's Micah, and there's only seven chapters in this book, but it's found, so the text that I have is Micah 6, verse 8. And it actually answers this question, what is good? And it goes like this. He has showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. I want to share with you my testimony and why this text is so important to me. You know, I didn't come to work for the church until quite late in life. And I want to share with you how I did. So, for, uh, go back six years, I was 50 years old, so that makes me, yeah. So I was 50 years old, sitting in my study, and I, um, I usually have this as a time for some prayer and reflection. Um, and I was reading the Bible and I was praying. And I was also, then I also saw a copy of the Australasian Record, which is our church newspaper. And in the newsletter, there was a um, article, it was a jobs vacant kind of an article, a little um, advertisement. And it was for a job that was um, in a conference not far from here. And I thought, and I, as I was looking at that job, I thought, I could do that job. You know, I could do that job. But um, it was not practical for me to do that job because it was in a conference not far from here. And um, I have a family. And as I shared with, the, um, with my um, Sabbath school class, my, son has a, my youngest son has a serious disability. And at that time, I was working full time at the Western Sydney University. And I was caring for him part time. My husband works part time in his own business, he has a business, and he was also caring for him. And it was quite a, quite a juggle trying to, um, do, to do this life work thing. And I had a senior role at the university and I had just signed a five year contract. They were very keen for me to continue working there in a relatively senior role um, as a senior manager of finance and infrastructure for, for one of its colleges. So there was nothing saying that I should look for a job, and certainly nothing saying I should look for a job in the church. Uh, I've, I've never worked for the church. So I've worked 30 years, never worked for the church. And many of you in the congregation sitting here never worked for the church, is that right? So, so, um, so I prayed this prayer after reading this ad. I said, Lord, if you want me to work for you, you will make sure that this job, and I gave them the big list of what this job was going to look like. Very, very, uh, very, very pro uh, prov provocative, I would say. And the, the, the job list said was something like this. It had to be pay enough so that I could make my mortgage payments. Um, it would have to be a job that would be 
challenging because, you know, I've worked in a senior role and I have worked in senior roles in finance. It had to be challenging. It had to work for my family situation. My husband had a small business in, um, in nearby um, Sydney and so we couldn't really go into state. It had to be a job that I could also care for my son, Kieran, who had the serious disability and required a lot of care. So I'd have to be able to do that as well. And so, I, and the list went on. And the last thing I said to God was, God, just so I know that you want me for this job, you're going to have to bring this job to me. I'm not looking for this job. So I put all those things to God and long list, put that to God, and I forgot about that prayer. Well, you know how it is when you, you know, when you ask God for something, but you, you're just sitting there waiting? God sometimes answers your prayer. So this is what happened two months after I prayed this prayer, which I had forgotten, but God hadn't. I got an email from Pastor Michael Worker, who at the time was president of Greater Sydney Conference. And he and I were friends because I was on the, one of the I was on the school's board, and I was also he also went to my local church. And he wrote to me and he said, "Eve, I'd like to come and visit you. I'd love to come and visit you, um, and with your with Victor, your husband." I said, "Oh, sure." I was head elder at my church at the time. I go to Epping Church, and I thought he's going to tell me that he's going to change my pastor on me. And I know that you've, you've experienced this. Those of you in church leadership know that, that conversation. He's going to change my pastor on me. My husband said, I don't think so, because he wouldn't have asked me to be there at this meeting. So he comes into my house, and he's got this real look of uncertainty and sheepishness. And I've never seen Michael look this way. And he had this real look of weirdness. And he comes into my house and he says, look, I don't know unless I ask, so I'm just going to put it out there. Would you like to be the CFO of Greater Sydney Conference? So here it is. And he was very surprised that I didn't look surprised, that it wasn't a bolt out of the blue. But when he said that to me, I thought, wow, um, this is an answer to prayer. I think God wants me to work for him. And, of course, that conversation, he says, well, look, I had to just put it out there. It's not a, it has to go through this process, and we will have to, through this committee process, we have to pray about it. And we would, I just wanted to see whether you were open to the idea. And so, um, after we went through the committee process, I was appointed as the CFO of Greater Sydney Conference. So here I was, 50 years old, never having worked for the church. Well, let me tell you, it was a culture shock working for the church. I had never been as someone who had a, you know, I didn't have a bad language problem, but I was so careful about what I could say, what I couldn't say, about being on my best behavior. It's like coming to church seven days a week. You know, I felt a bit like that, and I was so worried about about my behaviour and how whether I was would I, whether I would fit in, whether you know, and there, and certainly there are a lot of different things about working for the church. You know, for example, you know, we would pray at the start of every meeting. You know, I've never experienced it, that, but what a joy it is to pray at the start of every meeting. To have short devotionals at you know you know board meetings and, and executive meetings is not wonderful to have a prayerful attitude when you come to make decisions for God's church um, and you know to and, and and I found that people were a little bit gentler a little bit kinder and certainly a lot more polite and that was a wonderful thing to um, to be part of this this organization in that respect. You know, I was a little bit stressed, that I, as I said. I wanted to make sure that my behavior measured up to working in the church. Because not only was I a new employee, I also had one of the leadership positions. 
in the church. And people were going to look at me and judge me and see what I did and what I, and I, what I would do. Now, there is no question why we are here today. There's no question that God has given us a great commission. In Matthew 28, 19, you all know this text. It says, go ye to the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. So you know that's why we are here. God has given us a mandate to make disciples. That is our mission and that is what we are here to do. So I have no question about how, what we were there for, but how do we do it? And that's really important. The how is almost as important as why. And in February 2016, I had the privilege of going to the South Pacific Division Administrators Council. This is where, at all levels of church, we go to this big meeting and we meet other fellow administrators. This doesn't happen very often. And this was the first time it happened in five years. So I was privileged to go. And they quoted this text, Micah 6, verse 8. He has shown you all man what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And to me, this is the how. This is how we are to fulfill our mission. Because this is what was told to the people of Israel in a time of apostasy, of great apostasy, when Mark was trying to bring the people back to how God wanted them to operate. This was a time where both the leadership, the government leadership, and also the spiritual leadership were really bereft of, of principles. So, for me, what does this mean for me personally? You know, to do justly. To do justly means to do the right thing. To do the best that I can with good judgment. You know, I still remember my very first session, constituency session in August 2014. And I have to say, it was quite confronting for me, you know, sitting in front of hundreds of people representing the Church of Greater Sydney Conference and looking at us and seeing what were some of the things we, that the conference had done and what we hadn't done. And it was also a very difficult and painful time. We had made a very difficult decision. And to, it was to sell a beloved institution. And I personally am a graduate of that institution and it was very painful for me. It was, I was not part of that decision, but I was, I was supposed to be the person who dealt with the consequences of that decision. There's nothing I could do to reverse the decision, but I had to make sure that I would not squander the sacrifice of that sale, of that school. And I still remember having this talk with, with your, your, your delegates, in particular Dominic. I still remember having that conversation, the promise I made that I would do the very best that I could to not bring us back into that position again. And that is to do justly, to do the right thing, and to do with good judgment. And what that means, with, what does good judgment mean for me? Good judgment means for me that we have to do a lot of planning. We have to do a lot of planning to make sure that we don't go down the path that we had in the past. You know, there's a very famous saying that the failure to plan is a plan to fail. And that is true to a very great extent. And I just want to share with you this, this saying that came from Jesus' own mouth, Luke 14, verses 28 to 30. And it goes like this. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? 
For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this big person began to build and wasn't able to finish. And that is a great part of what we do, and that is one of the reasons why we've had some success along the way. We do a lot of planning. In our school's company, we plan 10 years out. We've, I've never done this in my professional career. I've never planned 10 years out, but I have had to in, in, our, in our conference. You know, so for our school's building program, I have to make sure that whatever I, we borrow as a school's company, that we have enough money to pay for it. Um, not just this year, not just next year, but for 10 years, so that we know that there are paths that we can take to success. And we just praise God that our schools are now doing very well, that the sacrifices of the past are currently being used to support the schools today. You know, seven years ago, we had less than 2,000 students in our school system. Praise God, today we have nearly 3,000. So what that means is that our schools are doing the right thing. We are, they are mission fields for us, that we use them to have long, um, long relationships with members of the community who come to us, who, who, who seek us, and that we, we may influence the next generation and even the current generation that is here. So that is what it is meant for me to do justly. To love mercy or to show kindness and compassion. And it's so, isn't it interesting that this whole lesson, uh, this whole quarter of lessons is really about compassion. To do justly or to do justice to the job that, you're, that you've entrusted me with is hard. I have to say it's very hard at times. But to love mercy in my job is even harder. Because I tell you what, accountants, that's what I am, are very good at being true and fair. That's what we do. I mean, that is the mantra of what we are. We, are, we believe in being true and fair to present the financial records in a true and fair light. There's no accounting standard that tells me to love mercy. The best we do in the counting standards is we're allowed to round up or round down or to, to have a materiality uh, standard, but we don't have one that loves mercy. And so it's not that natural for us to love mercy, but that is what God commands us to do. This is what is good, that we love mercy. So how do we, as a church or as a conference, love mercy? How do we as an organization, to be not just fair, but to be more than fair, or to love mercy? How do we embody this thing called compassion? Now, as a church, in, there are many ways we are very compassionate. But like anything, we absolutely need to do better. You know, for me sometimes, compassion competes with mission. And that's a terrible thing. We should be able to do both at the same time. Our mission needs to be compassion as well, to have compassion as well. But let me give you examples of where we do show some compassion. I go to at least 20 or 22 churches, between 20 and 22 churches every year um, for, for the purpose of what I am doing here, to help with the preaching um, program. And so we have over 100 congregations in our church in Greater Sydney. Can you believe that? Praise God. You know, when I started it, we had about 90, so we have now 102. So, as I go around these churches, I am so blessed to see how compassionate churches are, that they reach out in a very compassionate way. We have churches that have a real mission to feed the hungry. Um, you know, I'll give you an example. Mount Druid Church recently featured in its local newspaper about their food program that they do. We did, a, we did a study on food ministry, in fact, and we found that without even trying to work very hard, we found a dozen churches that have this regular food ministry like Mount Druid. And 
And that's not even, I'm sure there are many more than that that do this. We have young people who, who regularly mow lawns for their elderly neighbors. We have many churches that do mission projects and they do storm co and other things like that. You know, we have churches that support our mission in Redfern. We have a, a mission called The Way in Redfern and they have a, every Monday night they feed the poor. So people just come in and, and, um, and we give them free food. You know, our women's ministries with Crosslands do a hope stays where disadvantaged women, and some of them are, have suffered domestic violence, um, come free of charge for a, for a short, like a three-day um, three period where they get, you know, all these wonderful um, treatments and, and just love poured on them. And out of this particular ministry, this year they will have four baptisms. So there's so many, there's just so many wonderful things our churches are doing. But boy, could we do better. I'll give you another example where we could do better, which, which it's really difficult to say. Okay, you know that our conference runs Ignite. Every second year we have a big program, we all come together. We've, we've had two Ignites. We had one in 2017. We had one just this year in February. We're going to um, the Olympic Park. And we have this wonderful time. It's really joyful and joyous. So the first Ignite, 2017, the, the, the offering was towards church planting. And we had a tremendous response. You know, people weren't actually, we, we, we advertised, but probably not as well as we could have. But we received $67,000 out of the offering for planting churches. You know, praise God, that was all about mission. This year, the offering went to ADRA, 10,000 toes, and also the offering, uh, and also our two ADRA projects in Sydney, Blacktown and Macquarie Fields. Can you guess how much the offering was? 19,000. Less than a third of what we pay, gave two years before. So as a church, we're on fire for mission, but are we equally on fire for compassion? And that's a hard lesson for us. It was a very hard lesson. You know, I wanted to, our church to be more compassionate, but we really failed in that respect, that we didn't show we're great at mission, we may not be as well as um, in compassion. So what are we doing as a conference? We need to do better and we need to do more. So if you've noticed that our offerings, we have nine offerings a year for education. Well, our education company is now doing well. We don't really need the money that the offerings give us. We can, we can operate quite well without it. So the offerings for the seven out of nine offerings for education in our conference is now going towards scholarships. These are for people, families, children who want to come to our schools but cannot afford to come. And so your offerings in those education offerings are going to help others. And I think that's really important, that we can't keep focusing on ourselves all the time. We have to focus on others. And the beauty of that is it's tax deductible and, you know, it's wonderful that, you know, we're going to sit down later this year, we're going to invite people who cannot afford to come to our schools purely on a financial basis that they can't afford to come and we'll invite them to apply for our scholarships. So that, I, and one of the reasons why this happened, why I felt this way, was I went to our St. Mary's Church plant and I had a children's story. And I put, I said, how many of you are, co are coming to our schools? Because there are schools, there, are, there is a school nearby. And there were some kids put their hands up and one little boy said, I used to come to your school. I used to come to our Adventist school, but we could, but we don't anymore because I can't afford it. I don't want to hear stories like that. It's really sad. We need to be more compassionate. So that's why we have these offerings to help those who can't afford to come to come and receive a real blessing 
and Adventist vegetation. Other things that we do, but not enough of, is we have a fund for the needy. What that is, is that there's a small part of money that people have generously been given, and we help those who are going to be evicted from their houses. And we have people in, um, and this is particularly, we get references, we get referrals from Blacktown Adra and Macquarie Fields Adra, and there's so much, it is just a drop in the, in the ocean. It really is, and I see how much, one of, the, one of the sad things about this fund is we're only allowed to help people once. We, you can't ask again. And we know that people with financial problems in, you know, in particularly Western Sydney, um, it's a chronic issue for many of them, for many reasons. You know, they might have a disability, they might have an issue with, with drugs or alcohol, um, they may have broken families, and it's really sad, but we have the small fund that we do to support those who are in need. We've also decided that we're going to help those food ministries. So we bought a refrigerator truck because some of the churches were telling us, you know, we need a truck to help us get the food out there because we don't, we ha it's, it's very expensive. It costs $50,000 to buy a refrigerated truck. It's not something that a local church can have the budget for. So we bought a refrigerated truck so that a number of churches, particularly in Western Sydney, can borrow the truck when they need to so that they can go out and distribute the food. We park it at one of our, at our Mountain View school and so everybody has an equal opportunity to, go, to come and use the truck so that they can, because they were spending like $100 every time they wanted to rent the truck, so we do that now. And, we, and we're seeing how that goes, and if that goes really well, we'll try and, and operate trucks from other parts of Sydney, because the poor are everywhere. They're not just in Western Sydney. They're right here. They're right in my, in my congregation at Ebony as well. There are other things that our church is doing, particularly around compassion and kindness. You know, recently, our church invested quite a lot of money and continues to do so in starting up at SAFE. Now some of you who've been church members for a very long time, we think, oh, at SAFE, and we sort of do a little eye roll. <coughs> and the reason for that is, you know, back in the good old days, we never had all these rules. You know, we could do whatever we liked, and we just, we, oh yes, we loved and protected our, we loved our children, of course we did. But you know, the Royal Commission um, into the Institutional Abuse of, of Children and Vulnerable People, we had at least 60 cases of, um, that had presented to the Royal Commission on institutional abuse by our own church. And you know, my dear 86-year-old mother-in-law cannot believe, she says, oh yes, I see that happening in the Catholic Church, but it couldn't possibly happen in our Adventist churches. But I'm, I'm so sad and ashamed to say that yes, it does. Because we are humans through whatever church we belong to. You know, I believe this, that Satan works hard on those who are outside the church, but he works even harder on those that are inside the church. So we have these, this ad stick. And really, if you look at it, it's really about love and compassion. It's about putting putting processes, policies in place that we protect the most vulnerable. And that is showing compassion. That is loving mercy. Finally, to walk humbly with our God. For me personally, this is the hardest of all. How many of you have trouble with pride? This is a, I see Linda, Linda is, Linda Serica is sitting back there. She's our, um, our administration person um, in our youth department. And she gave a little talk this week um, in our uh, worship um, on pride. And so Linda, these are some of your words. You know, in the Bible, pride is such a common problem, isn't it? You think of all the people that um, have suffered from pride. You know, Cain, Esau, Saul, even Solomon 
the wisest man to ever live had a problem with pride. You know, what happened when the Queen of Sheba turned up? Oh, look how wonderful we are, how wealthy we are. And so for me, it's a constant battle. You know, because, you know, I'm proud to be a Seventh-day Adventist. I'm proud of our church. But you know, it's a bit like having children. You're proud of your children, aren't you? Even though they might be average, you're still proud of them. But you've got to temper that pride with humility. Um, you know, in the working world, which I, where I've come from, in the outside world, both public and private sector, it's all about personal achievement and personal advancement. And in those environments, as a Christian, it was difficult to compete, but you had to, to a certain extent. But in our church organization, you have to put yourself aside. You have to be proud of being part of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but also humble. So I want you to know that when I talk about achievements, we have to talk about what our achievements, we have to acknowledge them. We need to celebrate wins and success. But when we do, we must humbly acknowledge God. Because ultimately, all glory and honor must, and I have to emphasize this, must go to God. You know, it is by God's grace that we enjoy success. And it is by God's grace that we overcome failure. And it's only when we subject ourselves to God daily that we can overcome the sin of pride, that we can genuinely have a humble heart and genuinely walk humbly with Him. So back to Micah 6, 8. He has shown you O oh man and woman, what is good? And what do, does the Lord require of you? To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. And that, my dear friends of Concord Adventist Church, is how we do things around here. Amen. Thank you.